those of you watching on TV, we'd love for you to come be with us at 1030 on Sunday morning here at Antioch and Edgeley. For those of you that are here, let's all stand for the reading of God's word. We're going to start Matthew 16, 26 this morning and listen to what Jesus says. Matthew 16, 26. For what is a man profited if he should gain the whole world? And lose his own soul. Or what should a man give in exchange for his soul? Father, we just ask you to bless this word to open our eyes and make us ask ourselves the question, what's more important than going to heaven? What's more urgent than avoiding the flames of hell? Open our eyes today and for those that are listening on television that their eyes would be open and they'd realize that There's a God, and one day we're all going to stand in front of him. And it's up to us. It's our choice where we spend eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. And everybody be seated. You know, you got to ask yourself, and you look around, there are people that, man, they don't want to hear nothing about God. They don't want you preaching to them. They don't want to hear it. And you got to ask yourself, why? What's wrong with going to heaven? What's wrong with never dying? And you know, you, it's, you know, there's so many things the devil does to keep people from getting saved. That's the bottom line. The devil somehow is stopping people from getting saved. And I want to look at a few of these things today. In Matthew 13, 18, Jesus gives us some examples. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. Here's a man that's going to sow some seeds. He's got a big old sack of seeds and he's on his way to the garden. And he's going to go throw them out there and plant his stuff. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, like we're doing right now, this is what we're doing. We're throwing out seeds from the kingdom. And he understandeth it not. Folks, i got to tell you something. If you're not saved, you can't understand the Bible. And if you don't have the Spirit of God in you, you can sit here and hear me preach a sermon. You know, it's so odd. The other night, me and another fellow was talking to a guy. And he was saying, I wished I could know that I was saved. See, in his religion, they don't believe that you can know. You just got to hope for it, and you get your prize when you get there. And I took and I explained to him in explicit detail how Jesus pays it all. And, and when we got through talking to him, it was like he didn't hear nothing we said. i just like to know that if I could be saved. What do you think I've been telling you for 20 minutes, man? But you know what? When you're not saved, you can't grasp it. You can't comprehend it. And I guess it'd be like a nuclear physicist explaining to me something, how you split an atom. Hey, man, I, if it ain't got a hook in its mouth and you reel it in, I don't know nothing about none of that. This is a lot like that. People that are lost, they can't comprehend God. And it's sad, but that's what this says. He understood, then cometh the wicked one. That's a devil himself. And he catches the way, that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. You know, them seeds are falling on the ground, but before they can get a little root, the crows come and get them, and they pick them up, and they fly away with them. And just like right now, these seeds are being put in the audience. They're going over the air, over the TV. And before many people can get it in their heart and let it take root, The devil snatches it away. Oh, they get to daydreaming, or they get to thinking of something else, or maybe they just don't want to hear it and they're bored with it. But that's how that works. He that receives a seed in the stony places, this is a different situation here. The same heareth the word, and with and and boy, oh, it sounds so good. With joy receives. You know, you come to church and you hear me say. You know, we got a church family. We love each other. We pray for each other. Well, it sounds so good, don't it? In this old world of darkness and dog eat dog, it's nice to have people that love you. It's nice to know that when you come to church on Sunday morning, you're pleasing God by starting your week out the way he tells you to do it. Man, that's a big plus. It sounds good. But you know, next Sunday, you might stay up and watch the Late Late Show. Or you might go out and you're tired that Sunday morning. Maybe you even work all day Saturday and Sunday. You're wore out, whatever the case. And you don't come back to church. And you know it's sad because you see, you got a seed in you, but it's in the stones and there's nothing to nutrition it, to give it nutrition. 
got to come to church and keep hearing the word. And finally, it'll sprout and it'll start to grow in your heart. <coughs> Yet it hath not root in himself, but he endureth for a while. He likes it for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by, he's offended. It don't take much to get people out of church, y'all. It don't take much. I mean, I've seen people that just dearly loved it. One little thing would make them mad. Somebody would sit in their seat and they'd leave and never come back. Yeah, that's sad. He also that receives seed among thorns is he that hears the word and the cares of this world. You know what? I don't care what anybody thinks. I'm going to put Jesus first in my life because I realize how important he is. What people think about me doesn't mean anything. Most of them that don't like me are never going to like me anyhow. It don't matter what I do. I could hand out $20 bills, and yeah, but I remember one time he, well, you know what? I give up on that right there. I want to please God, not people. And, you know, the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of, you know, this riches and fame and fortune, it's a deception. I know so many people, they make their fortune, and they're miserable when they get it. Money and all that stuff is not going to make you happy. Now, if you've got God in your life and he blesses you with the money, that can sure make a wonderful life. But you've got to have God in there, not just the money. God is the foundation of everything. And you know what? It chokes the word and it becomes unfruitful. It's sad today. There's so many young people that they're not Christians because the world has choked the word out of them. They're ashamed. They're embarrassed. You know, I don't know if you know this, but right now our president of the United States is sending billions of dollars to Africa and other third world countries to promote atheism. Now, is that unbelievable? We're supposed to be a Christian nation, and we're taking our hard-earned tax dollars from you and sending them to countries that are struggling, looking for God, and sticking atheism down their throat. Now, don't tell me we're not in trouble. We're in trouble. But you know what? I'm not ashamed of Jesus. And I'm not ashamed of his words. That's his Bible. I'm going to preach it. I'm going to believe it. And even though it contradicts the lifestyles in America today, even though it's not politically correct, I'm still going to preach and believe this word. Because Jesus himself said in Luke 9, 26, for whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words, he just soon said me in the Bible, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come and folks listen good in his own glory. You know, we think of Jesus, he's so loving with his blue robe and his sandals. And when he comes back in his glory, folks, he's not going to be that sweet little shepherd boy. People are going to fall to their knees when they look into his face. When he speaks, it's going to sound like thunder rolling. And the ground is going to shake. And they're going to go face to face with Jesus. But not just Jesus, look. <coughs> and his fathers and the holy angel, the whole kit and caboodle is coming down from heaven. It ain't going to be just Jesus. It's going to be the Holy Ghost. It's going to be the Father. It's going to be all the mighty angels and warriors in heaven. And people are going to stand before them. And all these people that's criticized God, run God down, they're going to have a chance to see it, looking him in the eye. I don't want to be on that side. I know I say this all the time, but I remember Phil Donahue one time was running God down, saying what a lousy job he did creating the earth. And he said, well, God might have created the earth, but couldn't he have done it better? I can't wait to see old Phil down and he stand before God and say that to him. Uh, I'm going to hope I'm standing there watching. Folks, I want to be on the right side of this issue. When that mighty God steps out of a cloud and the earth begins to rumble and crack and shake, I want him to put his arm around me and say, this is my little buddy here. And folks, that's what you got in Jesus. Don't ever make the mistake about this world is not your friend. The people that will laugh at you and make fun of you and that you're worried about impressing, they are not your friends. You only got one true friend. His name is Jesus. Remember that, folks. Remember that. <clears throat> but he that receiveth seed into good ground 
is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. You know, we don't all have the same talents. And we don't have the same fervor. Some people are just prayer warriors. Man, they pray for something. You take it to the bank, it's going to happen. Other people just have compassion. And they care about one another. See, we don't never put that on the mighty list. Oh, yeah, you don't preach. You don't play an instrument. You're not an evangelist. Well, those are big jobs. They might bear 60 or 40 or 100 fold. But you've got a job to do. And maybe it's not a one in the limelight. But yet you're working for God. And you know what? People don't realize it. One of the most important things you can do is what you're doing right now. I know y'all tired. I know this morning you could have stayed in bed. And I know a lot of you would love to be fishing on a pretty day like this. But you made a choice. No, I'm not going to sleep in. I'm not going to go to the beach. I'm going to go to God's house this morning and tell him how much I love him by being there. And how I appreciate the week that I just enjoyed behind me. Even if I went through some bad stuff, I'm here and he got me through it. I'm going to open up a songbook, and even though we don't have much of a band up there, I'm going to sing along with them, and I'm going to praise God for what he done for me. And then the most important part, I believe, is to not be ashamed of his word, but to get in it and learn it. And there's no better way to learn the Bible than with us together in the presence of God in his house. You're doing a good thing today. Keep it up. Because you see, folks, when you realize all these ways the devil has tried to snatch the seed out of your heart or suppress the seed from growing or choke the seed. Remember one thing. God in heaven, the mightiest force in the universe, loved you so much that he had a son that we, we can't comprehend that. But he has a son. He loves him just like you would love yours or more. And he sent Jesus to this earth and said, Son, I want you to turn yourself into a man that can bleed and sweat. I want you to be a man that can get thirsty and hungry and even have your feelings hurt. See, now he's not in all of his glory when he came down as a man. Now, now I don't want you to let them beat you to death. You to love them and raise them from the dead and make the blind ones see. And in the end, they're going to show you their appreciation by nailing you to a cross. But then you're going to show them something the world never seen. You're going to come back from the dead and you're going to show them who we are. There's no question about who God is. Confucius, he's still dead and so is Buddha. And so is Muhammad and all the rest of those fictitious deities that people made up. And they know they made it up and they'll admit they made it up. I asked a Hindu one time, I asked him about all this uh, reincarnation and all that stuff. And I said, do you really believe all that? You, you know, he was telling me that if you're good, you come back as a mule or something. But if you're bad, you could be a spider or maybe a lizard. And I said, you really and truly think that? And he said, oh, no, we don't believe any of that. What? No, we don't believe any of that. Years ago, 400 years ago in India, they had an outbreak of leprosy. And the smart people, which didn't know nothing at all, they got to look at these sores, and it was greasy. It'd be like a greasy spot. Then it would bust and turn, and then you had leprosy. So they decided it was from eating meat. So they said, we've got to stop our people from eating cattle and stuff. Well, I got it. Let's tell them Grandpa died, and that cow's Grandpa now. They won't want to eat Grandpa. Could be Grandma or a cousin or something. They done that to stop their people from eating cattle. And they knew all along it wasn't true, but it was a way to regulate society. That's not what you and I worship. That's not what you and I believe. The Savior came down from heaven and let us beat him to death in front of the whole world. And then three days later, he's eating fish and honeycomb on the beach, shaking people's hands, preaching sermons to them, walking around, everybody looking at the hole. Totally different situation. God so loved you and I that he sent his son to rescue us from a mistake we made. Well, didn't God know we'd eat that fruit in the garden? Sure, he knew it. <coughs> but in order for us to live in heaven with him, we had to be conditioned. 
So he put us in a perfect environment, the Garden of Eden. And said, you can do anything you want, just don't eat that fruit because it'll kill you and you'll go to hell. And we did not believe God and we gobbled it up. Just like the devil tricked us into doing, told us God lied to us. But then we made a big mistake and we belonged to the devil after that. It was just like signing the contract. God loved us so much, he said, I've got to get them back. I've got to get my babies back. I'll give them a chance. I know what I'll do. Well, he couldn't have said, devil, can I have them back? That wasn't going to happen. We chose the devil, and the devil said, they're mine now. They're going to my kingdom called hell. God said, what would you like more than anything in the world? Well, you know what that would be? It's, the devil would like to see God die. God said, I'll tell you what I'll do. They didn't believe me. They believed you. So I'll let them kill me. I'll turn myself into a man like them, and they can kill me. And if they believe I died for them, and if they believe I came back from the dead because I'm God, and they'll tell me that, I get them back. I'm sure the devil threw his old horned head back and laughed and said, Oh, I hate, you had them in a paradise, and I tricked them and got them, and now own the very dirt they walk on. I own their soul, and you think you're going to possibly get them back? That's why the devil goes so, through so much trouble with false prophets and everything else to keep you from coming back to God. Because, folks, you don't have to be perfect to go to heaven. You don't have to quit sinning to go to heaven. you got to believe Jesus died on that cross and rose from the dead and say it out loud and say, Lord, I believe you died, and I believe you rose. The Bible said if you really believe it, he'll save you right then and there for good. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him, through him and him only might be saved. Folks, there's a chance you could go to heaven. There's a chance you could be saved from hell if you will believe own the name of the Son of God. Now, if you believe in him, you got a good start. But i got to tell you, there's a difference between in and own. If I believe in God, it means I believe in his existence. But one day, many years ago, I believed own Jesus. And I put my trust on him, my faith on him, my life is built upon him, and my salvation is on the rock. And that's why he that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Because he had not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. You know, folks, when a kid reaches the age of accountability, he gets what he got from the fruit. A baby don't know right from wrong. But when we ate that fruit, our eyes were open and we saw we were naked and we seen right from wrong. And at that point, you're accountable for it. And there's not one of us in here can hold up to that accountability and say, I've never sinned. I've never told a lie. Oh, I told a bucket full of them. I never stole nothing. No, yeah. But you know what I'm trying to get at. But one thing about Jesus said, I know you've done all them bad things, but I'll wash it all the way with my blood if you just believe me. You ain't going to find a better deal than that. You know that? And this is the condemnation. <laughs> that light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. You know, it's funny how you go in the kitchen at night, turn on the light, and all the cockroaches run home. You notice that? They might be on the coffee pot over trying to get under that cake cover. and But you turn on the light, and they all run home, get under the cracks and crevices, and they're all gone. Because you see people that are doing what they're not supposed to do, and they like to cover in darkness. And you know what? If you like to be in the dark with your evil, you don't want me shining a light on what you're doing wrong. You want to stay that way. And that's the condemnation. People need to stop and say, is my sin, is my wicked lifestyle worth dying going to hell for? Maybe I ought to listen to what that preacher has got saying. Man, give Jesus a try. But the devil won't hardly let people do that. Everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Why do you think we get a politician that tries to put God back in America? The media, the movie stars, the politicians, they hate them. They loathe them, and they work until they get them destroyed. 
neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. I don't know about you, but I want my deeds reproved. I want to know what I'm doing wrong. I want God to correct me when I'm out of line. I don't want to be, be displeasing to God. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest that they are right with God. You know something? You and I, we come to church and we listen to these words from the Bible, from the Word of God, and we analyze ourselves and we judge ourselves and we learn what we do to please God and what we might be doing to infuriate God. And we correct it. And I want to hear it. I mean, I... I used to admire Andrew Johnson because he'd always say, boy, you stomped on my toes today, and I sure enjoyed it. And what he meant by that is, boy, you corrected me on some stuff today that I see straight now. That's a sign of a real Christian. And here's the sad thing, y'all. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is in the image of God, should shine unto them. You know, people, they have the wrong conception of Jesus. The wrong perception. They don't want him. There's people that hate him. They hate him. And they don't realize how in the world could you hate someone that loves you more than you could understand the word love. Because the devil, the God of this world, in the garden we ate the fruit, we signed it all over to him. He has blinded the minds of people that they might not think they need Jesus or they might hate Jesus. But one thing's for sure, they misunderstand who Jesus is. Because once you let the glorious light of the gospel shine unto you, Matthew eleven twenty eight is a picture of what Jesus is. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Today, there's people that are heavy laden with sickness, with poverty, being poor. They got marital problems. They've got, some people are lonely. There's a lot of people that are addicted to things and they're just trying all they can not to let it kill them. And they're heavy laden. Oh, this burden is so heavy. Sometimes they think I can't go another day. I've had people on chemotherapy watch this on television and call my house and say, oh, brother, I, don't, I, I didn't think I could get through another day, and I heard you preach a sermon, and it gave me hope, and I'm trying again. That's what you have to do. In Jesus, don't ever give up. But you're heavy laden. Come to Jesus, and you know what? He can give you rest. And, folks, I'm going to tell you something about that word rest. That means peace of mind. I like going to bed at night with a smile on my face because it don't matter what they're trying to blow up or what new disease they send over here. Jesus ain't going to let nothing happen to me. And if worse comes to work and they incinerate the earth, I'm going to wake up standing on streets made of gold with Mama and Daddy and my family waiting on me. Hmm, you can't go wrong. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. You know, my yoke, a, a ox pulls a yoke, plows. Jesus said, come work for me, and you'll find out my plow's easy to pull. I won't ask you to do nothing more than you enjoy doing. Get out and make a difference in people's life and watch them smile when you're through talking with them. Nothing wrong with that. My yoke is easy. And you know what? You shall find rest for your souls. And when you interpret that, it means your joy is full. Ain't that what we want is to be happy? Then why would we avoid the only one that can give it? You know, we'll try drugs. We'll try alcohol. We'll try other things. None of that's going to satisfy you like Jesus. And the bad thing is all that stuff will kill you because that's ways for the flesh to find relaxation. Do it Jesus' way and he'll give you relaxation and peace and happiness and unspeakable joy and in the end you'll have victory. I'm going to go with the Lord. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But I'll tell you something, folks. Today people don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear the truth in any kind of way. 
today, and you can see it through the news media. They're making billions of dollars by lying to people every day, all day long, and people are eating it like soup. This January 6th joke that's going on right now, they're calling out a trial, but they only have one side telling their lies. And they got these people that hate goodness and they hate America. And they're just sucking up like pigs at a trough. And none of it's true. With all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish in 2 Thessalonians 2.10, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Folks, if you love the truth, you're going to start searching for Jesus and reading your Bible. Many won't, though, because they can't handle the truth. <coughs> for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. You know, I learned something a long time ago about reading the Bible. Every time somebody wanted something, good or bad, God gave it to them. See, like Lucifer, for example, he wanted to be God. Well, he is now. He's the God of this world, and he's going to be the God of a place called hell where everything is just like him, rotten. But nevertheless, you look out throughout your Bible. When people wanted something, God let them have it, whether it was good or bad. And you know what? You want to be lied to? You want to watch MSNBC and CNN and let them twist your brain? Of course, today, like in our schools, this CRT, they're brainwashing our children. They're desensitizing, and, man, they are indoctrinating our children. And you talk to them, most of these kids when they get out of school, they hate America. They hate America. They hate Christians. That they might all be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You know something? If you love this unrighteous world so much, there's no room for Jesus, you'll pay the consequences. If you love this sinful generation and you want to be part of it so much that you don't want to hear the truth, well, you won't. But Jesus says this to everybody. John 8, 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Folks, that is so important because no matter what circumstances you got, the truth is what's going to get you out of it. You know, if you're not feeling good, you don't know why, but every day you're feeling worse and you go to the doctor, he takes your blood and he analyzes it and he comes out and he says, oh, I got the truth. You got a shortage of iron in your blood. We'll give you a few iron shots and some vitamins and you'll feel like a million bucks. And guess what? That doctor figured out the truth that you need to hear, and you believed it, and you performed it, and now you're feeling better. It's that simple. It's just that simple. But the devil don't want you knowing the truth. So what has he done in Matthew 24, 11? Many false prophets shall rise. And what are they going to do? Shall deceive many. You know something, folks? They're changing the Bible. They're twisting the scriptures. So much going on to deceive people. And all these little occults that we got. And any religion's a good religion. That the devil made that up, folks. There's two brothers in the very beginning of the Bible, two brothers, Cain and Abel. They came to church one morning and they done it the way they thought it should be done. Man, old Abel come up there and he was well, oh, he was like that with God. He knew what God wanted, man. He brought him a lamb and God said, Oh, you such a good boy, Abel. I love that lamb you brought me. Then here comes old Cain. He didn't know enough about God to even know what God was thinking about him. He brought a bunch of wheat and a couple apples and boom, dumped them out there. And God said, well, what is that? Well, I brought my sacrifice. I'm having church here. God said, I don't want that junk. Get that weeds and stuff out of here. He rejected it. So don't think for a minute you can worship God the way you want to. You've got to do it the way God tells you to. And if you don't give God what he tells you to give him, you just soon not waste your time. Today, they got these false prophets. They're teaching people to pray in crazy ways that don't look past the ceiling. Praying to people that could never answer your prayer. There's only one that can answer your prayer, the one that died on the cross. I know people that pray to the saints. I know people that pray to all kinds of stuff I never even heard of. St. Panopolopagopagus or something. And I never even heard of these people. 
but to pray into him. If you're going to pray, pray to Jesus. And I, you've heard me say it before, and I'm going to say it again because it's taken over America, this meditating hogwash. Every commercial you see now, somebody get their bowl of cereal and they're, they're meditating before they have their Cheerios. If you're going to meditate, pray. If you're going to bow your head and close your eyes, say, Jesus, I need something. That meditating is hogwash. Your relatives cannot answer your prayer. Your relatives are not going to get you out of trouble, and they're not going to give you anything. Mine wouldn't when they were alive. <laughs> no, down here dead, I ain't going to get nothing out of them. But that's neither here nor there. Point I'm trying to make today is if you want to pray, you pray to Jesus, and he'll answer your prayers. Many false prophets are deceiving many. Beloved, in 1 John 4, 1, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Folks, <coughs> don't believe everybody you hear. Don't believe every preacher. Look at your Bible and make sure what they're saying is what it says. It's just that simple. And look, here it is right here. Search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. But they are they which testify of me. You know, we think we're going, well, I'm, yeah, I never killed them. The Bible says not to kill. I never killed. Th I think I'm going to. Folks, do you think you're going to heaven? Or have you looked at it for yourself? And you know what it says. See, I know what the Bible says. I know exactly what the Bible says. I've studied it over and over and over. I've studied Greek and Hebrew so I can make sure if this word says learn here, that in Greek I know what it means. Get to know me. Jesus said, get to know me. You'll love me. Get to know me. I've spent hours on hours and hours learning the word of God because I want to be sure that what I'm telling you is right. And I love in Philippians 2.12, Wherefore, my beloved, this talking to you, as you've always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Folks, the most serious thing you'll ever do in your life is to know that you're right with God, is to know that your prayers are the way he tells you to pray, to know that what you're doing for him is pleasing in his sight, and not infuriating him. Study to show yourself approved. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. That's what we are doing right now. And you see, folks, again, I would never get up here and twist one thing. I would never lead you astray because this Bible told me flat out, I'm accountable. That's right. And you think that don't scare me? I'm very careful that everything I tell you is right out of this book. If it steps on my toes, well, I put some Vic Sav on them when I get home, but I'm going to tell you the truth. Amen? Because here's the truth about the matter. In Matthew 7, 20, not in 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, the will of my Father which is in heaven. It can't be done my way. It can't be done your way. It can't be done some religion. It's got to be the will of the Father. And you know what his will is? That everybody comes to his son, falls on their bones, and says, Lord, I believe you died and rose. Save me. That's what his will is. And it's going to break my heart one day because many people that you think are good people and they try to be, but if you don't get saved, God don't even know you. And, you know, people can't grasp that. The devil got you. He tricked you. And the trick for us is to get bought back. And Jesus bought you with coins of pain. With his last drop of blood, he bought you back. But you've got to agree to it. And just like he said, when a young man goes up to a young lady and said, 
I would like to marry you. Will you marry me? Well, he chose her to be the bride. You know what I mean? He called her to be the bride. But until she says, yes, I'll marry you, she hasn't been chosen for a wedding. God is telling you now, come to me, you heavy laden, and I'll give you rest and happiness and eternal life. But it's up to you to say, yes, Lord, I want you to. That's what this is telling us, folks. And if you don't do that, you belong to the devil, and it don't matter how many good deeds you do, it don't matter what you think or what you thought, or even if you never killed anybody. You've got to come to God. And this is why the Bible said in Matthew 7, 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name we've cast out devils. In thy name, Lord, we've done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Boy, that's a harsh I wouldn't slam a door that hard, but you know something? God's letting us know flat out. If you don't do it the way Jesus laid it out, you ain't never came back to God. You know, the Bible said the devil built a wall, a partition between you and God. Once he got your soul, well, you're on one side of the wall and God's on the other side. But God the Father said, Jesus can tear that wall down. <laughs> oh, it's so hard to do, man. Well, let me show you what you got to do to get that wall tore down. In Romans 10, 9, that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Well, but brother, but Russell, you don't know how bad I've been. and You don't know what, what I've done. Folks, it don't matter how bad you've been. It don't matter what you've done. Jesus loves you and he wants to save you and he will if you ask him. And that's why it said in Romans 10, 13, for whosoever... How rotten you are, how no good shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. And far as for my friend the other day saying, I just wished I could know. Well, it's in the Bible. If you do what I just read to you, listen in 1 John 5, 13. These things have I written unto you that believe what? Own the name of the Son of God that you may know that you already have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. You know, if something, the way it's worded, you can know you're not going to have it when you get to heaven. You've got it now. When you came to this altar, or you knelt by your bedside, or however you got saved, maybe in a sycamore tree like Zacchaeus. But when you did that, God said, now you have eternal life. Finish out your time on earth and learn what you need to learn. And one day when you got it all learned, I'm going to bring you up here with me and you're going to live with me and all your loved ones for eternity. And you're not going to do like Lucifer and mishandle it and lose it because you're going to be educated. You're going to know better. That's the purpose of life. What's the meaning of life? The meaning of life is to get conditioned so we can live forever in heaven. That's the meaning of life. <coughs> <coughs> Yeah, I know there's a lot of people that say, well, I just can't get saved. I got a, oh, my best friend, one of my best friends I grew up with, he just said, I just can't believe that Jesus stuff. I, I just can't believe, you know. Well, folks, that's another reason people don't accept Jesus, and that's what they give in exchange for their soul is unbelief. But I want to show you something in Romans 1.20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. Folks, let's just think about a few things, just a few things. Gravity. You ever think why we don't fall off the earth when we're on the bottom side? Because God made an invisible thing called gravity that keeps you planted to the ground. Oh, what? well, maybe it's coincidence. Maybe it's coincidence. What about your lungs? You know what? you got a set of lungs, and they take... Well, it just so happens there's oxygen in the air. How'd that get there? Well, anyway, your lungs take this oxygen out of there and they put it all through your body. And you know you can't live without oxygen? Not even a couple minutes. <laughs> and your eyeballs and your ears, the eyes the most. I know the evolutionists say that water dripped on a rock. 
and it formed an eyeball. That rock could see. I, I don't get that one. Don't know what a rock would want to look at. But I know one thing. Your eye is the most complex thing. We can't build one. At night, it's got a lid on it. It closes. <laughs> got a pupil that when it's dark, it gets bigger, so it brings in more light. There ain't no way that just happened to be. That eardrum, you know, it's funny. How it just so happens there's sound waves and all different ones, and they mean different things. And we have an eardrum that interprets that sound. Boy, that's lucky. <laughs> Let's talk about the digestive system. You know, it's odd that, you know, you wouldn't put a seed in the ground, you grow turnips and potatoes and onions and carrots, and then we can eat them, <laughs> and it gives us life. We live off of it. And the one that gets me the most. Okay, okay, let's say it was evolution and somehow a life form began. Well, why didn't it just die off? How did it just happen a male and a female came out of this? Think about that, folks. That's the clincher. You could take all that other hogwash where there's no evidence of evolution, not that much. And that's a fact. But you could take all that evolution and say, but. How did it wind up male and female with a reproductive system that a mama can carry a baby in her body, give birth to it, and has the ability to make food for it and feed it? You still believe in a big bang? Well, we've got vascular systems that carry the blood throughout our body. Your fingernails are just in the right. What if the fingernails on the back of your head? What would you do with that? You'd tear a hole in your pillow. They're in the right place. You know what I'm saying, folks? And it goes on and on and on. You know, I'm just going to give you this one last thing because I love it. They got a thing called a bombardier beetle. It's actually, we call it a blister beetle. And in his little belly, he's got two sacs that have chemicals in them. I, one of them's peroxide, one of them's something else. They're segregated because if they mix, he blows up immediately goes to 212 degrees when these two chemicals are mixed. Now, if you touch him, he will squirt this juice on you, and when it comes out of his little abdomen, it crosses in midair, and by the time it touches you, it's 212 degrees. Did someone create that? That little beetle will put a blister on you that's not funny. He's got this deadly chemical in his little body, but it never mixes unless you step on it or something, you know. And then he still gets to burn you. But the point of the matter is God made all of these things. That's why the fish can breathe underwater. And birds can fly in the atmosphere with ease. A worm can live in the dirt. God made these things to show you there's nothing impossible when it comes to God. <laughs> but people don't believe it. And they're without excuse. There is no way we could be here by coincidence or accidents or Big Bang or even evolution. But more and more people today, the statistics are staggering. How many people reject God and don't know him and don't want to know him? And you know what the Bible says in Isaiah 5, 14? Therefore, hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure and their glory and their multitude and their pomp. And he that rejoices shall descend into it. You know something, folks? That's three of the most deadly things, the multitude. If you follow Hollywood and you live like that bunch of devils, you're doomed. Pomp, people there are too proud. They're too cocky. They, they're not going to stoop down low enough to call on God. And, of course, rejoice. Today, people are so busy partying and having a blast, they ain't got time for God. Most people are not in church this morning because they got a hangover from last night. And I'll tell you, it's sad. This ought to be how you start every week. Doing business with God in God's house. And I can't say it enough. You might not be a good singer, but you can open up that hymnal and you can croak out the words, victory in Jesus. And you might think it's croaking, but to God, it's like tasting a bite of honey. Because it's coming from your heart. And you know, I want to close with this thought. If you're a Christian, be for real. Really, really care about people. Really, really love God. 
really say your prayers and think about what you're praying about. Because there ain't many of us left. We're like dinosaurs, getting fewer and fewer. So, with the handful of us left, we really need to be serious about our job. Follow this Bible to the letter. I know churches today, they've got rock climbing walls and basketball courts. and That's great. But that's not what we're here for. I'd love to have a, something that, you know, we could do like that. But we're just a handful of us country folks. We don't have a whole lot of that stuff. But one thing we do have, we got the truth. Amen. And that'll set you free. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this word today. Thank you for being so good to us and for you writing down everything we need to know and how to perform that which is good. We love you, Lord. And I pray if there's one here that's lost that today they'd come and talk with me so I could lead them to you. For people watching it on TV that, Lord, they'd come to you and they'd ask you to save them, whether it's in their bed tonight or wherever, wherever they choose to call upon that mighty name, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for sending him. Thank you for saving us. For it's all in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on.